it's a privilege to see, you know, intergenerational transmission occur again and again and again. The rep repetition of the births, right? With, with Hemi Mesu. Um, our next pre uh, presenter is Dr. Kamal Rashid. Kamal Rashid chairs the Education Committee of the Comedic Institute and is chair of the Education Commission of ASCAC's Midwest region. He is an assistant professor of education foundations and inquiry at National Lewis University in Chicago. He also directs an independent teaching and research institute called Et Seba in Kamenu. He earned his PhD in sociology of education at the University of Illinois in 2009. He earned an MA in inner city studies education from Northeastern Illinois University and earned his BA in sociology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Rashid's research focuses on African-American history and culture, particularly intergenerational gen dynamics of African-American social critique. He is exploring the theorizing of W.E.B. Du Bois and contemporary African-centered scholars and critical race theorists. Currently, he is developing an oral history and archival project focused on African-American social movements in Chicago, in, this, in the Chicago area, from the 1960s to the 1980s. He also writes and teaches about socially conscious hip hop. Kamal Rashid is an active member, is active in a number of community organizations in the Chicago area. This is true. So uh, our brother Kamal Rashid. Hotep, I have permission from elders to speak. Thank you. So this presentation, um, in the program is listed as uh, Ma'ada's Liberatory Praxis. And one of the struggles that I've had is, uh, is really dealing with an idea that uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers talks about and, and in all of his works, but he says it really well in, um, in uh, Black Intellectuals on the Crisis of Black Education about this imperative of black intellectuals breaking the chains that link African ideas to European ones. And, and this, whole, this idea of language, I think, becomes critically important because it becomes very difficult to, for us to liberate ourselves without using a set, a, a set of concepts that augments that process. So, so I decided to modify the title a bit to kind of to emphasize that message, to emphasize that point, and hopefully the implications of that will become clear as I proceed. So the title has been revised to Jed Ma'at Ir Ma'at, which is to speak Ma'at, to do Ma'at. Ma'at is liberatory praxis. Whenever we talk about anything being liberatory, we're talking about things that enable our freedom and praxis, of course, is the, the unity of thought and action. In, the, in this case, the thought of, of perhaps speaking and doing in the comedic world view. So this, this piece actually comes out of, of, of two different contexts. Uh, this last fall, beginning last fall, I developed this class for young people. It was, uh, it was titled African Philosophy, an Introduction to African Deep Thought. And this, the class was for people ages 8 to 14. At least that was who, who signed up for the class. And I'm, I'm teaching that same class now, and it's roughly the same age distribution. And so Ma'at was, was significantly present in the course. And also, of course, uh, from the, I think about the mid-fall to the present, I've been participating in this uh, uh, discussion that's facilitated by uh, Yvonne Jones through the Temple of the African Community of Chicago called The Divine Conversation, where we deal with text. Uh, and, and one of the ideas that came up in one of those conversations with the, was with something that I mentioned in the conversation, because right now we're reading these texts with the idea of how do we enact these ideas? How do we use these ideas to transform the condition of our people? So one of the things that I mentioned in one of these conversations, well, we need to institutionalize Ma'at. So at some point she invited me to speak at the temple, so it was on February the 2nd. And so this is the, the paper that I presented, absent the PowerPoint. So today what I'm going to do is to go through parts of this. I doubt that I'll be able to get through all of it. But what I want to do is to give you a rough overview uh, of at least how I'm thinking about this idea. How do we institutionalize Ma'at? How do we marshal Ma'at as a, as a set of ideas, as a set of values, as also as a set of actions that enable, that informs our work to liberate ourselves in the world? And liberation, and I have to say this from the outset, when, when, I'm, when I speak of liberation, I don't mean just how we liberate our minds, recognizing, of course, that, that is a prerequisite for us being, being able to liberate our bodies. But liberating our minds is only part of the process. The rest of the process extra, is extricating our bodies from the in, in, uh, oppressive snare in which we are presently uh, trapped. So, so that idea of how Ma'at enables us and informs how we actually engage in the work of physically liberating African people, I think, is also an important piece which I take up in here. And so we'll talk about 
I talk about time because I think if we really want to understand African mind, we have to understand the African view of time. From that, we'll get into this idea of, of who humans are, the, the African ontology of the human being, as well as how we can look at Ma'at to understand our present situation. So I want to look at uh, one particular comedic text, which is the Lamentations of Ipuwer, which is what uh, Theophile Binga House labeled in uh, African philosophy, and, and the Husi is labeled as um, the, uh, it's not the Lamentations of Ipuwer, so it's a different title, but it's Ipuwer is implicated in the title. And then lastly, this idea of how do we, how do we take Ma'at and use Ma'at to free ourselves. One of the things, and this is something that that uh, Yvonne Jones presented on last year at ASCAC, and I just want to go through this real quick. She made this wonderful point about this discourse among the Egyptologists that situates the various spiritual communities in ancient Kemet as being in competition with each other. And, and she, she dealt with this, and I thought she dealt with it in a very interesting way, but, but her point conveys, that should be conveys, not conveys, so that's, that's not cool, because you can't see it now, you can see it. Uh, and you can't see the bottom part of that, which is not good, good, but I'll read it to you. Her point conveys, that should be conveys, it says conveys, which is not right the unity or unicity of the African worldview. So when we talk about unity, we're talking about how things are bound together, oftentimes how they're bound together for a particular purpose. Unicity, however, and this is what it says, unicity means oneness. It means that those things which appear to be separate on the surface are actually the differentiated, differentiated expressions of the same reality. So when we talk about the unicity of a thing, we're talking about things that are actually one. They may look different. They may sound different. They may be differently located, differently situated in space and time. They're actually a, a, an expression of the same phenomenon. The this principle of, of unicity, I think, is essential to fully apprehend the nature of the African worldview. That while variegated evidence is a common set of core principles, which is why we see this a lot, particularly among African centered folks. People will talk about ancient Kemet, they'll talk about Dogon, they'll talk about uh, the Yoruba, they'll talk about all these different African communities and their worldview because there's a unicity to African thought. But also, particularly as it relates to this idea of African spirituality, and, and part of when, part of what, what was happening in these conversations that we were having at the Divine Conversation is that there's this idea. There's this idea that in many instances what people conceptualize as spirituality is infused with the escapist tendencies of the culture in which we exist. By that I mean, we stand unfortunately, or fortunately, at a precipice. Uh, we stand at a moment, in fact, that is evidence of a confluence of crises. By that I mean, if we look at the state of Africans today, if we just look at the state of the African continent, and, and not only the existing dimensions of neocolonialism, but what the context of the global economy adds to that, in terms of the presence of China. Uh, or if we look at African communities in the United States, like one of the things that, that I think about quite often, and I was talking to, I think I was talking to Bobby Larry about this, but one of the interesting things is that the, the spaces that have traditionally been our communities are places that are under siege. I really appreciated uh, Baba uh, Mariba Kelsey's presentation this morning because towards the end of his presentation, he talked about gentrification. And, and I thought that was very, very appropriate because one of the things that we find is that many of the communities that in many cases have been the basis for the work that we have done to transform ourselves are places that we are increasingly having, or are increasingly finding inaccessible, right? And not just the physical spaces in which we inhabit, but also those community institutions within those communities that we once used, that we once marshaled in our efforts to free ourselves, increasingly we're finding our access to those spaces diminishing. So what that says to me is that our capacity as a community, I suspect, is diminishing for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that, one of the things that, that's interesting, and Baba Mariba's presentation really drove this home, he said that in this, this Philadelphia community in Atlanta, there were 43 churches in a one square mile radius, which is absolutely astounding. If these were the types of churches that, gained, that garnered the support of Africans in the mid 19th century during the height of Africans' agitation against the system of enslavement, that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Because in many instances, those institutions might be directed towards the acquisition of social power and the insurance of the, of the liberty of African people. But within the context of the present, I'm not sure if that's what the concern may be. And so in fact, if we see, in this case, that these religious institutions become a vehicle for us to escape dealing forthrightly with the crises that, are, that, are, that loom before us, then they may not actually be useful. So, so part of what I want to reframe is even this idea of how we think about spirituality. And, and of course, you know, this is not an, an uh, unfamiliar conversation, I think, for most of us here. But the, but the point is that given that spirituality is bound up in the African worldview, that means there are other elements that are bound up within it, like ethics. And of course, ethics isn't just our concept of right and wrong and, and what we should and should not do. 
but it's also bound up in our sacred obligations, which I think is critically important. I want to talk about that and how uh, our ancestors in Kemet dealt with this idea. But I want to start off with time. And, and there are two ways we can think about time. How many of you all watched Cosmos last week on Fox? If you didn't, you should watch that show. It's on, you can watch the video stream on the internet now. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is hosting the show. It's really, it was, there were some problems. There were some, some criticisms that we can get into about it. But he, he talked about this idea of the emergence of the universe. And, and what we see oftentimes with these narratives of the universe that emerge out of astrophysics is that they're bound up in this physical notion of time. That's essentially this idea that time is something we can measure. And that's it. We measure time. And that's a useful idea, right? It's useful for me to know that I have, I don't know, 22 minutes left in this presentation, perhaps. <laughs> that's useful. So I'm not saying that time as, a, as a, an empirical quality is, is completely useless. It is not. It's actually quite useful. But there are other ways of thinking about time that makes time, that puts time in service for our efforts, puts time in service of the issues and interests that we have as human beings. Dr. Beatty's presentation this morning, and I think you made a point last year similar to it in terms of how the Septepi was conceptualized as a standard, as a standard of cultural regeneration, is an idea of how we look at time thematically. And so when we talk about time as a physical phenomenon, essentially we're talking about this idea of how time can be used as a process of measurement. But we also deal with the ontological nature of time. When we deal with the ontological nature of time, we deal with what time means. Now when we talk about what time means, we're talking about what it means to us. And ideally, if we have our minds right, what it means to us is something that's consistent with our interests and consistent with our worldview. And so in this sense, we assign meaning to time. We ascribe significance to time and we attempt to explain its very nature. So this is the, Kikong, this is the Congolese uh, cosmogram, the Dikenga. And real quick, the yellow circle at the bottom represents the conception of a thing. This is if, you're, if, you, if you garden, if you grow food, this is when you put the seed in the ground. You know, no plant yet exists, but the potential for the plant is there because you put the seed in the ground. As you move up to the black circle, the black circle represents birth. You know, now you see that sprout having burst through the soil. The red circle at the top represents maturation. This is always everybody's favorite time. And it will be, depending on how much you grew, how much, how much survived the squirrels and the Jap we have Japanese beetles in, around where I live in Chicago, and slugs. So this is always a happy time because maturation, this red circle is where you get to harvest, at least what survives. Uh, and sometimes more survives than other times. And then that white circle represents death and transformation. This is, for us, late in the summer. This is where the plants have gone to seed. Like last year, we messed around and lettuce. We didn't harvest nearly as much lettuce as we could have, and it was also very hot. And so by the time we got out there to harvest the lettuce, the lettuce had gone to seed. And nothing tastes right once it goes to seed. That's the time, you know, to let it go to seed, then you can harvest it, you can dry the seeds and use them again for next year. But, but what the Congo people are attempting to describe, they're attempting to describe the way in which things exist within time, you know, ideas. Before an idea is fully formed in your mind, the potential of that idea exists. I think all of us, if we think about some great epiphany that we have, we can all go back maybe years or maybe decades before that experience and think about all the moments that precipitated the emergence of that idea in, in its full form. Uh, and then when that idea finally manifests itself into the world, it continues along that arc until we reach sort of the height of our understanding about that idea and finally that idea may fade, perhaps replaced by a new iteration of that idea. And so they argued that everything, the Congolese people argued that everything went through this cycle. Uh, ideas, states, governments, businesses, whatever, everything goes through this cycle, the universe itself. I, I, I use this just to demonstrate this idea that even though in this idea they're not talking about Ma'at, explicitly they are talking about Ma'at. Because part of the African view, and this is what was really interesting about Cosmos, Part of the interesting thing about European astrophysics is this idea that the universe emerges, but the, the early universe is a chaotic place. You know, and, and the idea is that it basically ceases to be chaotic probably within the last uh, few billion years, um, the last dozen or so billion years. Um, but the early universe is conceived, as of this as, as conceived of as a chaotic place. Inter in the African worldview, the idea is that even things which appear to be cha chaotic may represent particular stages in a temporal progression, a temporal progression towards a particular state of being. And so the idea of ma'at, this idea of an orderly progression of things, this idea of a cyclical progression of things, is an idea that has implications in terms of how we think about time. And we see ideas analogous to this in Kemet, not quite like this. This is a very interesting representation. Uh, and this, this is another representation called the historical spiral cycle. 
which I won't really get into too much, but this comes from a group uh, in D.C., the Ankabia Society. This is in a book called The Sankofa Movement, Re-Africanization and the Reality of War. Also dealing with this idea of a cyclical notion of time. I won't deal with everything that's up here, but I want to just point out that at the bottom you have ISFET, which they, they've defined as maximal disorder, chaos, African subjugation, and dependency. And you'll notice there's a black uh, line. Starts at the bottom, goes up to the top, to Ma'at, which is divine order, African preeminence, and then spirals back down. And so they argue that we're moving through these cycles. In fact, that they are cycles within the cycles. They are multiple iterations of cycles. And again, we're dealing with this idea, again, dealing with this idea, African idea of time. And I want to, you know, this idea of time has significant implications because how we conceptualize time has implications for how we see ourselves, how we see the malaise of African people, how we understand that malaise, and also how we conceive of our particular present moment and what lies beyond this. And this is one of our challenges. One of our challenges is, as, as a people, is our ability to conceptualize a future in which we have achieved, we have returned to the lofty potential inherent in what is conceptualized as the Septuagint. One of our challenges is conceptualizing ourselves in a state that is markedly different from the moment in which we presently exist. And there's a text in ancient Kemet that I think really captures this really well, which is the text, um, The Lamentations of People Wear. Again, this text is in the Husea, it's in uh, uh, Theophilo Benga's African Philosophy of the Peronic Period. And basically, it's a reflection on social decline. Uh, one of the things about the text, when you read the text, the text is rich with images. One of the, uh, one of the things that my children and I do in the African philosophy class that I taught grew out of this, my children and I meditate. And usually when we meditate, we'll, we'll read a particular text, usually something from Kemet or something from the Yoruba or, or someplace else, usually more like 99% of the time something that's African. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, we'll discuss the implications of this text, and then somebody will lead the meditation where we're compelled to think about this text and to, you know, and hopefully internalize this text so that we can use it in our lives. And there was a point where I, I used this text, and it was just a little part, and the one part it was, is, uh, and this is, the, the wording is a little different in some of the different translations, but in this particular translation talked about how the farmer has to go to plow with his shield. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, you are a farmer, that's your job. You know, you've committed yourself to producing food to feed your family and ideally to feed the nation. But because of the perilous state of affairs, you cannot engage in your work, you know, forthrightly. You have to be fettered with the, the onerous quandary of defending your life, potentially, while you're out in the fields. And it goes on and on to talk about the dispossessed, people who once were rich who are now paupers, you know, and, and so on. Uh, it talks about foreign occupiers, marauding gangs, usurpers, and the like. The text, I think, is very interesting because, as I say on here, Upuwa looks out upon a world that is characteristic of maximal chaos and disorder. And he, I, I think in a lot of respects, he describes a world very much like our own. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, Black Power by Stokely Carmichael and uh, Kwame Ture rather than Charles V. Hamilton? There's a good section in that book where he talks about this idea of internal colonialism. He applies this idea of internal colonialism to the, the situation of Africans in this country. And it's an imperfect analogy, but I think there, there, are, there are lots of things about the analogy that, that I think are very important. The basic thing, the basic point that I'll make about the, that analogy of the black community as an internal colony is that what it suggests is a community that does not have a locus of internal control. What do I mean by that? The locus of control for any community should be where? Where should that community be controlled? That community, right? So if your community is down the street, the people that control that community should live down the street within that community, not 20 miles away. We could extend that idea to nations, right? If, the, you know, if you have a nation and the nation has a capital, the locus of control is supposed to be the capital, not Washington, D.C., not London, not Paris. Fortunately, we live in a world where the latter is true and not the former, it would seem. And there are lots of ways we can get at this, whether we talk about um, the colonization of the economies of black communities, uh, whether we talk about the in ineptitude of institutions within the community, whether because they are not controlled by people within the community or because they are insufficiently poised to respond to the challenges of the community. Nonetheless, we're talking about what, what many people, many, many of the social scientists refer to as social disorganization. I think our ancestors captured it more appropriately, though, by calling it ISFET. A socially disorganized community is a community where the social systems of the community are not organized in a way to maximize the well-being of the folks that live within that community. And I like that idea. I like at least the, the, what social disorganization captures. I don't like the reality of that. But I think the idea of ISFET is probably more appropriate because it conveys 
chaos. It conveys a process where things are out of control. I'm from Chicago, and uh, there's some instances in some places of Chicago that really captures this idea where when you watch the news at night, and in the news, I'm not saying that the news is a valid representation of what's co what is constitutive of reality, but many of us have this impression that we live in communities where there's a locus of cultural control that is no longer, no longer within the community. You know, where if we talk about the value systems that Africans subscribe to, that you know, many people would, would argue that we are not the purveyors, we are not the architects nor the purveyors of the value systems that say many African youth are responsive to, that those value systems come from elsewhere. Maybe Sony and Bartlesman AG and AOL Time Warner, but, but certainly not, many people would argue, at least their families and the intergenerational di cultural norms of those families. That, that creates a very interesting quandary. The, the, the essence of that being that if we exist within a community that is not in control, no, sorry, that is not controlled by the people of the community, if we exist within a community whose progression through time is not being directed by the people within that community, we're not talking about order. We're talking about chaos. We're talking about isfet. And so Ibuware, I think, gives us a very interesting idea, a very interesting model of what this looks like. Again, communities that are bereft of a locus of local control, which is... Uh, which, which was really echoed by something that uh, Baba Ajay Koto, one of the co-authors of that book, said at the Sankofa, the Sankofa conference, this is eight years ago, he said that everything is broken, meaning our, our systems are broken. And they're not broken by happenstance, they're broken because we're at war. And, you know, as any people who are in war, we have to bolster our capacity to engage in struggle, to prevail. Um, I want to jump ahead to, to this one idea, this is what I want to talk about, in terms of one of the implications of this text. Because in this text, the Lamentation of the Ipiwe goes beyond simply talking about the condition of the land, but it also talks about the role of the king, and it also talks about the role of the people. And so you have a diagnosis of the problem, a description of the problem, but also you have, you have the people who are the agents of change also being positioned within the text. So this is something that Theophile Obinga says. He says, the pharaoh in his capacity as guarantor of Ma'at was naturally the supreme lord of the country. He was responsible for the maintenance of universal harmony. If that harmony got ruptured, the entire country fell prey to terrible crises in the form of tremendous social upheavals and terrible psychological, economic, and cultural troubles. And when you read the text, that's what you see. But I want to take this further, and this is also something that Dr. Carruthers says. Similarly, says the Nasut's overall function, like that of Usir, is to establish is the establishment of Ma'at and Tawi. That is, to establish conditions where enlightenment will prevail over ignorance. And so this text emphasizes, and this kind of echoes uh, Mama Muriel's presentation earlier about governance in Kemet and how Ma'at was inextricably woven into the Kemetic conceptualization of governance. It also echoes this idea that Ma'at wasn't an abstract ideal, but it was the ideal, the sort of the cardinal virtue that the highest uh, officials in the society, the prime minister, the king, and, and, and all of the local officials and so on, had to adhere to. But there's another level for this, and that's the role of the people. And so while the pharaoh's charge was to concretize Ma'at and the national life of Kemet, this should not obscure the role of the masses of the populace whose work would enable Ma'at to permeate society. So by aspiring to the social ideals of Ma'at, the citizens of Kemet were expressing the values of the nation and emulating the principles that they believe govern the cosmos. And so the idea is that, yes, the rule of the society sets the standard, but the people, through their work, through their work of cultural transition, of cultural transmission, through their work of building and sustaining the institutions of society, through their work of being the stewards of the culture, they, in effect, ensure that Ma'at remains a salient value within the fabric of the society. And the reason I think this is important is because I think it situates the person the, the, the everyday average person, the citizen in the comedic society, as being particularly consequential in terms of bringing about and sustaining order in the society. And I think that this has implications for how we see, how we may potentially see ourselves. So I want to talk uh, very quickly about the ontology of the human being. Uh, and the comedic ontology of humans is, is, is a way, and I view the comedic ontology of humans as a way of explicating how one might conceptualize the role that each of us play in the restoration of Ma'at. There are a number of narratives that, uh, in Kemet that, that dramatize the significance and the role of humans. And I want to give uh, one example of this. And you can't see these bottom bullet points, so I'll just read them. But, but one of the texts that, that I think does a very interesting job of laying out the role of humans is the Book of Knowing the Creations of Ra. This is how it's labeled in the Husea by Karenga, at least. 
Uh, and there's a section in there titled The Four Good Deeds to the Creator. And it lays out four basic deeds. The first one is the four winds, which is the atmosphere. The next is the great flood for irrigation, which it represents the shared bounty of the nation's agriculture. And this is really, really important uh, because we actually we live in a world now where the bounty of agriculture is increasingly bound up, bound within the purview of a handful of global multinational corporations, the Arthur Daniel, Daniel Midland Company, ADM, uh, 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 Monsanto, and Argyle. And so there's a, a effort afoot to deny populations all around the world this thing which has been a fundamental part of the maintenance of human life, at least for the last 18,000 years, which is the bounty of agriculture. Uh, the third one is the making of every person, this is a quote, every person like his and her fellow, end quote which is this idea that virtue is, is a part of the basic makeup of the human being. And also an inescapable awareness of, quote, the day of death, which refers to our mortality, our conscious awareness that none of us are immortal, which means that we carry with us certain obligations to the past, but also to the future. And, you know, when we think about the, this first deed, the first deed deals with this idea of environment. You know, I remember there was a, a brother uh, that I know, good, good, good friend of mine, in fact, posted on Facebook. He said that, you know, I don't consider myself an environmental activist, and he goes on to say something else. And what struck me that, as odd about that is because he's a person who considers himself really steeped in African spirituality. And I, I, I had a hard time fathoming, how could you see yourself as someone who understands and practices African spirituality, but you, consider, you don't consider yourself an environmentalist? Because I don't think that if we, if we really study not just the ideas, not just the philosophies that come out of Africa, but many of the structural dynamics of African societies, we see this effort, this concerted effort for African societies to exist in concert with their environments, to create uh, a state of balance, to create ma'at in terms of how they existed within the context of the natural environment. And so, but, but this idea also, also has significant implications in terms of how we think about our impact, how we think about our impact on the future. The second deed, of course, deals with agriculture, which I talked about, but it also goes back to this idea that I talked about from the, Kikong, from the Congolese people, this idea of cycles. You know, so the, the bounty of agriculture represents more than just the, the process of harvesting, I'm sorry, of, of planting and growing and harvesting, but it also represents an effort by most people in the, his, on the, his, in the history of the world to live within the natural cycles of the world, which is very, very significant because regrettably, we all live within a society whose economy is unsustainable whose social systems are basically unsustainable. And, and regrettably for those of us who will continue to live to the middle and the end of this century, that has very, very dire consequences indeed. So, so that's that. The third deed deals with you know, this idea of what is the basic nature of humans. And there are a couple of things in this, this section, in, this, in that part of the text that I think are important. But one is this idea of order of us having, in fact, a sense of self-imposed order uh, and how we use that sense of self-imposed order to regulate our behavior. Since again, this idea of practicing and internalizing my art. And then lastly, this fourth deed, which is our obligations, not just to ourselves, but also to those that come after us. And in the text, it alludes to not only our obligations to the ancestors, but also obligations to the nature. And so the, the bullet points I say that the first our ancestral obliga obligations, that is, honoring our ancestors as we would hope that our progeny will honor us after our passing. And I don't remember if it was Brother Greg's presentation during his uh, libation this morning, I think it was, we were talking about our grandchildren's grandchildren understanding the particular pivotal moment where we are situated in terms of the flow of African history. And so part of that, part of what we are attempting to do or what we do in honoring our ancestors is that we teach our children to honor their ancestors. We teach our grandchildren to honor their ancestors. And so, in fact, we ensure the survival of our memory. The second is the venerating of the highest ideals of Kemet, which, are, you know, in many cases, we can look at as being represented in the form of the Necheru. Uh, Rakheti uh, uh, Wimbi Amin, in her book, in her essay, rather, on the philosophy of African spirituality and also in her book, um, uh, Ma'at, Living uh, Life-Centered Life, I think is, I'm, I'm messing up the title. But she gives an interesting definition for uh, nature and nature, which is that the nature are the infinite manifestations of nature, which is the, the totality of existence. And so that's why what that brother said really puzzled me so, because he considers himself an adherent of comedic spirituality. And I'm like, if you understand nature, then you have to understand that the earth is yours, the earth is sacred. You know, the, the, the systems, whether we're, whether we're talking about water, whether we're talking about soil, whether we're talking about air, whether we're talking about any of the natural environments that exist on this planet, they also have a sacred significance. And so our ancestors didn't see this separation between their beliefs, their ideals, and the world in which they live. These things were inextricably linked to one another for the sake, not just of their ideals and values, but for the very sake of their survival. And lastly, of course, these serve to reinforce the practice, 
maintenance and refinement of the culture's most sacred or highly valued ideals, serving as a saber yet or instructions for future, for humans, uh, human development. Uh, I would talk about Tao Te, but I know I don't have time to do that. So I'm going to jump ahead. Three minutes, yeah, I told you I don't have time. So I'm going to jump ahead to the end, restoring my, reclaiming the world. Um, in the paper, and this paper should be out later this year in the, uh, the Eternal Year, the African, edited by um, Bart McSwine and Asante Wapong from Third World Press. So it's supposed to be out sometime this fall, so you can read the whole thing then. But I want to end with this idea of what, what are the implications of, of these ideas? What are the implications of us understanding the nature of time? Un uh, what are the implications of understanding, by understanding the nature of time, understanding our role as humans in terms of facilitating the progression of this cycle and restoring African civilization? And each of the texts that I talk about in there, I think, has implications in terms of how we think about my eye. But this is one, this is a quote, you can't see it very well, but this is, uh, this is from uh, Malana Karinga's book, Ma'at says the, the Saba, Seba Ma'at, the moral teacher, in the tradition of Patahotep uh, et al, is not concerned with truth or justice as abstracts, but as kinds of practice, as essential elements in the just and good society and in the good life, and as contributions to the ground of human flourishing. Therefore, in the Sebayetic tradition, Ma'at is not truth or justice as abstracted ideal, but as something one speaks and does, loves, wills, and practices. And so, my point is that I think the practice of ma'at is, is more important than ever. Again, we're at a confluence of crises. Um, and our actions have very significant implications for the future. I think, and, and I'm not one of those people that operates from this, this idea, because a lot of people have this idea that black people are some kind of elemental force in the universe, that black people have been here for such a long time. Surely we will always be. I don't, I don't believe that at all. You know, dodo birds, I'm sure, existed for tens of thousands of years, and they are long gone from this earth. Uh, if you, if you know, though the Permian extinction happened about 250 million years ago, there had been species that existed for millions of years, wiped out during the Permian extinction. And so nothing, nothing, the, the existence of nothing is guaranteed in the world. So my argument is that if Africans are to survive, we have to ensure our survival. And, and one of the things that I think is important is that Ma'at is not the antithesis of this fit. Uh, Ma'at represents the natural order of things. This fit is a, you know, aberration of that. So in striving to overcome this fear, we are not only seeking to reclaim African culture and restore African sovereignty in the world, we're also seeking to restore harmony uh, to the earth itself. And so this poses a basic challenge in conceptualizing how the practice of Ma'at leads incontrovertibly towards these goals. And this is what Dr. Carruthers said. He says, in order to liberate ourselves, we must take the world and then reorganize it according to our worldview. Only then will mankind be allowed to live in harmony with the universe. Only then will we be truly free. And so I think he leads as a potent challenge to take and reorganize the world. And, and the question becomes, how, do, how does this happen? How does it maintain? I'm probably out of time. There's some ideas that I have in here about how that can be done. But I think it begins by us critically engaging in the difficult work of internalizing African deep thought, by internalizing the practice of Ma'at, by thinking about, particularly when we think about that text of Seven Good Deeds of the Creator, and what the implications are of our actions to those different contexts, whether it's in the environment, whether it's future generations, whether it's the people that exist around us, but also how our actions inform the institutionalization of Ma'at, meaning we have to commit ourselves to supporting institutions like ASCAT that are about the business of, of concretizing Ma'at within the world, but also communities, educational communities, even educators, you know, uh, whether that's curriculum development, whether that's building schools, whether that's supporting schools, whether that's supporting, there are lots of institutions in the community and movements. One example that, that we're in the midst of right now in Chicago is this local movement for food security. Uh, a lot of people really get this twisted, but our efforts to, our efforts to reign to gain control of the food systems that sustain black people, I maintain is actually very consistent with the African worldview, because no sovereign people does not feed themselves. There's no sovereign people that exists in the world that does not have the capacity to feed themselves. And it allows us to, re to restore a level of order, control, and balance within our existence that we can never achieve with the level of dependency that presently exists. And, and one of the things that came up in many of these conversations that we've had in Chicago around the importance of localized agriculture is this idea that our conceptualization of African culture, or in fact, our ability to, to live out African culture and to fully apprehend aspects of the African worldview are, are bound up in our idea to see the connections between ourselves and the world in which we live and, by, and build and the building of the very systems that ensure our survival. And so with that, I'll close. Asante Sane.